and not a peep has been heard from the Duke and Duchess of Sussex following the announcement of Princess of Wales and uh, the King Charles and King Charles are having uh, hospital treatment. Harry and Meghan have remained completely silent since the news broke, despite hundreds of well-wishers leaving messages of support. Meanwhile, Harry is said to be preparing for his Living Legend of Aviation Award at a gala event in Beverly Hills this evening. Well, this comes as it's revealed the King has dropped both Prince Andrew and Prince Harry from standing in as monarchs should he be taken unwell or go abroad. The pair will still technically retain their royal roles, but under the new provision, they will never actually be called upon for the position. Uh, let's speak now to uh, Dickie Arbiter, royal commentator and, of course, former Buckingham Palace spokesperson. Uh, Dickie, uh, what are your thoughts on the fact uh, that uh, that couple in California that uh, we like to refer to as the gruesome twosome, Harry and Meghan, <laughs> have not in any way uh, commented on the plight of uh, Harry's father, the King, and his sister-in-law, the Princess of Wales, both of whom, as we all know, are going through rather major health scares at the moment. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts initially are, since they left uh, the UK three years ago, just over three years ago, I've never given them the benefit of the doubt because what they've done is unforgivable. I think I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt this time that maybe they haven't been silent. Maybe they have privately um, sent good wishes to the Princess of Wales and the King for his forthcoming operation next week and not gone public. It would go completely against the grain because they've gone public with everything. Uh, you name it, they've yes. said it, and they've said it in, in loud and clear. And if they had the chance, they'd even do it sign writing in the sky. But I'd like to think that they've done the decent thing, or at least Harry has done the decent thing, because he's a decent guy uh, underneath all this bravado. And I'd like to think that he has sent a message to his sister-in-law and to his dad. But will we ever know? I don't know. I don't think so. It's staggering, really, to see two... So, I mean, the King himself and the Princess of Wales, two extremely high-profile members of the royal family, both in hospital at the same time. Do you think that that timing has somehow been quite deliberate? I was reading somewhere that perhaps Charles has chosen to go into hospital at the same time as Kate, to almost offer some degree of protection, to take the focus and speculation away from her. This sounds like conspiracy theory, uh, theories. Uh, no, look... It was a planned operation, we are told, by Kensington Palace for the Princess of Wales. Um, you go in when the uh, when the surgeon's ready for you. You go in when the bed is ready for you. Uh, and you go in uh, uh, as a matter of urgency, because otherwise you wouldn't be having an operation. As far as the king is concerned, yeah, th there is a need for him to go and get this prostrate sorted out. And the sooner the better. And now is really better because... It's kind of the quiet time of the year. Yes, he's still doing his, his red boxes, state papers and, and what have you. But in terms of engagements, there'd be fewer engagements to cancel now than there would be if he were doing it, say, in February or March or even April. So it's not a conspiracy. It's not time that they coincide with each other. It is done as a matter of course that they've got to be done. The King's is not urgent. But what he has done by being transparent over this uh, whole prostate issue is sort of saying, OK, guys, this is a man issue. Go and get a checkup because you'll be sorry if you don't. And I, th I think those are, that, that, that's a good signal to come out from Yeah, him. I think that was what, that was uh, magnificent of the King because uh, Kate could not have kept her condition secret because she's going to be out of action, won't be seen until Easter, so people would ask questions. But the King could certainly have ke kept his uh, prostate problems quiet and private, uh, but he chose not to, to encourage men to get checked, so uh, he deserves our admiration for that. Uh, a very good uh, thing to do. Uh, can I get your thoughts uh, again, Dickie, on uh, this story that uh, emerged the other day um, from Robert Hardman's excellent book, which has obviously been written with the uh, tacit approval of the palace and very, very uh, obvious insider help from the palace, uh, from palace aides. Uh, the story that the Queen was as angry as anyone had ever seen her when Harry and Meghan uh, named their kid Lilibet. They then said, which was, of course, her childhood nickname because she couldn't pronounce it, Elizabeth. The only person, apparently, who called her that for her entire life was her beloved husband, Philip. 
Uh, and she, she was furious that they took this name. They didn't ask her. The BBC reported that. And uh, Harry and Meghan tried to legally threaten them. If you don't re retract that story, uh, we will, you'll face legal action. It's defamatory. They then expected the Queen to back her up and in her rage to back them up. And in her rage, uh, that she didn't. And that legal action disappeared. That, that is just the lowest of the low, is it not? To tell a lie and then try and enforce it with expensive lawyers and not to have asked the Queen in the first place. Outrageous, I think. But... Well, it's interesting you say that, uh, that the BBC uh, were, were being threatened. I said at the time uh, when the name came out, I very much doubted whether they had spoken to the Queen or even asked permission. They probably said after the event, after it appeared on Instagram, that that's what they were calling their daughter. But I very much doubted at the time whether they had put that to the late Queen uh, in asking her permission. Uh, they, they, they backtracked because they knew they were hide on to nothing uh, in terms of trying to sue the BBC for having said that. They would have had to sue a lot of people mm. and they knew that they were on dodgy ground. It's very unfortunate that this has come about in terms of naming their daughter Lilibet. It was a favourite name. It was a name that was kind of created by her, by the late Queen, because she couldn't pronounce Elizabeth. It was taken up by her grandfather, George V, and the family, her father and her mother called her Lilibet. Mother used to, usually called her darling, uh, but very occasionally called her Lilibet. And, and Princess Margaret, her sister, called her Lilibet, and as you rightly say, Prince Philip. But you count the number of people on one hand who would have called her Lilibet. Nobody else would have ever dared to do that. And that she, that she uh, was angry doesn't surprise me. I saw her angry once, uh, and I wouldn't have liked to have been at the end of that. So, <laughs> yes, she probably was angry and uh, probably said, yep, they, I don't own the palaces, I don't own the pictures, I don't own the art, I don't own the land, uh, I just own my name, and they've stolen that. Yeah. I mean, very often she doesn't, uh, even uh, in, in, in her death, get to own the narrative about her with the sort of wall mantra of never complain, never explain. And the recent, I think, final episode in the series The Crown is suggesting that she was troubled constantly by thoughts of whether she should abdicate or not. And Ugh. yet, uh, Robert Hardman has uh, set the record straight and said, I doubt this ever crossed her mind at all. Can we have a little... Uh, spare with us, uh, Dick. We've got to have a little listen to uh, Robert Hardman talking to uh, Talk Today on Talk TV earlier today. When, when you've been sort of preparing for this uh, and you've, you've had it in the back of your mind. Well, one thing I, I also discovered, that there was no sense of impatience on his part. He was very stoical about, you know, when this day comes, I'll be king. There was no, no effort to, to try and sort of uh, jump ahead. I know that's been a sort of plot line in the crowd, but mm. it's just not the case. Mm. He, he, he very much sort of, look, it's in the hands of the almighty. Um, but when it came, he was, uh, you know, he, he was ready. He, it was all in his head. There was no sort of big master plan. He'd thought it through, but he hadn't discussed it with everybody because he didn't want to undermine the authority of the Queen. And I think it's very telling that right up to her final days, she was still absolutely the Queen in charge. Yeah, Dickie, the, despite the Queen of Denmark recently abdicating, uh, I think the British royal family, it was, it's never, ever been considered that either the Queen abdicated or now that uh, Charles abdicates so William can step up. It's called primogeniture, you know, the oldest child inherits the throne, and that's sacred to our royal family, isn't it? It is sacred to our royal family, and let's put the whole thing in context. You mentioned the Queen of Denmark. Uh, abdicating. She's 83. That's not old at all. But she did have very, very major back operation last year. And that somewhat incapacitated her. And her decision was probably taken off the back of her second cousin, who the Queen, late Queen Elizabeth was her second cousin, slowly going downhill, becoming frailer and frailer, having mobility issues. And Margareta probably didn't want to go that route and probably felt as a result of the back operation, she did find it difficult to move. She did, uh, she was in pain, she did use a stick and she felt that she probably didn't want to go the same route as the queen uh, and therefore decided to abdicate. Now we don't do abdication in this country yet. Edward VIII abdicated in favor of the woman he loved and went off to marry her in Paris and never lived happily ever after. <laughs> but. Our Queen said very firmly as Princess Elizabeth when she turned 21 in her 21st birthday speech, I'm not going to bore you with it, but I'm going to say it anyway. 
I declare before you all that the whole of my life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to you and the great imperial family to which we all belong. But we don't have an imperial family, but we certainly have a Commonwealth family. And she kept true to her word. Abdication was never, ever on her mind at all. Stepping aside was never on her mind. Regency, never on her mind. As long as she was uh, mentally capable, she was physically capable as well of doing the job. And as you rightly say, she did it right up until the end, even to nominating uh, people that she felt deserved the honor of order of merit. They were in the box yeah. um, that was taken down to her private secretary shortly after she passed. So abdication was never, never, ever uh, in, in, in her mind, as it is isn't with the with the king the king won't abdicate he's perfectly healthy yes he's having a prostate next week uh so many people do so many people's uh come out of it and they're fit and healthy he will continue until he draws his last breath in very much the same way as her, his mother did on september the 8th in 2022